We're so excited to be here and worship with you. So can we do that together? Would you stand to your feet? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, your word says that we can come into your presence and you will fill the place. So we thank you, Lord, for filling this place as we fill it with your praise. Thank you, Lord. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on and sing it with me. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross. And he rose up from the grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet we shout out your praise. Come on and declare this with us. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing that again. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. In your presence, rich joy. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion. Every 
every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before
How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee And how great Thou art sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings the prayer team to come up to the side there at this time if there's any prayer that you want agreement with this morning we just want to set this time for that in Jesus name Let me through the fire. 
Savior in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness. Oh, if you know he's been good to you, come on and lift your hands up across this room. Yeah. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have, Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will see of the goodness of God your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you This is running after, running after me, yes. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me.
Jesus. So Lord, right now, for every person standing here that needs a touch from you, maybe in their physical body, maybe in relationships, maybe in their finances, there are miracles that need to take place. We put our hope and our trust in you right now. Lord, we make an exchange and we cast our cares on you because you care for us. So we give you what we can't fix, Jesus, because we know that you are the rescuer, you are the deliverer, you are the healer, and you are the restorer. So let our hearts be at rest in who you are this morning, knowing that you will take care of those things that we entrust to you. It's written in your word. We stand on it, we believe for it, and we know you're good for it, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So happy to share this morning with you, um, seeing new faces and some friends and family. We're so glad that you're all here. And I'm excited to dig into his word this morning because his word is what changes things, right? So would you turn to Mark chapter 5? In a few minutes, we're going to get to that. But even before that, as I was praying and preparing for the morning, that verse from Proverbs 18.10 kept coming into my mind. The, Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they're safe. You know, in today's world, we need a safe place, right? And we have one, and that's called the name of the Lord. Just his name is a covering, safe place where we can run to and be protected be loved, be strengthened, get rest in the midst of things that can be so wearying. So I want us to just, we're going to pray and um, ask God to bring us into the safety of the strength of his name. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your powerful word. We thank you that it's a light to our feet. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I thank you that you open it up, that you make it real, that Holy Spirit, you cause things to be heard by ears that don't even come out of my mouth because you are in this conversation. So thank you, Father, for this time. May it be all that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. I was at a women's event years ago leading worship and it was just a time we were just soaking in God's presence, worshiping him. And all of a sudden, I just got such a strong sense of his healing as I was behind the keyboard. And the Lord kind of singled out a woman that I had met earlier. And I just heard him say, I'm, I'm healing Joan right now. So I, I said that to her. I said, God, or I said, Joan, God is healing you right now. So, and that was it. We just kept on going. I just did what I felt like God said to do. And then later on, in the midst of the day, Joan and I crossed paths, and she's like, you know, when you said that to me, she's like, I, I hurt my Achilles this week, and I moved around my ankle, and it still hurt. And I'm like, no, he didn't heal me. And then she said, and then I realized I took a deep breath. And without her context, I didn't understand the magnitude of that, but she went on to share that 20 years prior, she had gotten too close to a kerosene heater, and it damaged her lungs. She had been to doctors, she had gotten the treatments that they could offer, and the outcome of the doctors, the prognosis was, this is how they'll be for the rest of your life. She said, even this week, she was like, I went to Bible study, but they were um, blacktopping the parking lot. So the smell was so strong and it was tightening me up. I had to leave Bible study, get in my car and go home because she said, I just, my lungs don't work the way they should. And she was like, I feel like my lungs are balloons and they're going to pop. Because for the first time in 20 years, her lungs were expanding to their full capacity. She was looking for God to heal her Achilles that she had hurt that week. And here, he healed a disorder and a disease that had come into her lungs that she had been dealing with for 20 years. Just like that. Don't you love when God sneaks up on you like that? 
Do you know that there are things in our lives that we can learn to make adjustments for? We get used to. We begin altering our lives. Maybe you have back trouble, so you walk differently, and you're just used to it. Your body kind of compensates, right? But with God, he knows what to do with the foot that we hurt this week, and he also knows what to do with the ailment we've been dealing with for 20 years. He also knows what to do with the life situations that are pressing in on us. He knows what to do with them. We don't have to live under the prognosis of the diagnosis. We can live in the provision of God's promise. And that's what I want us to dig into this morning. In Mark chapter 5, 24 to 34, you've probably all heard this story, but let's read it together. The story of the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes... I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out for him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. A four-year-old asked their mom, mommy, what happens if your phone goes in the potty? Mom answers, why? The four-year-old responded, never mind. The prognosis for that phone was not so good. The prognosis of the diagnosis brings pressure into our lives. It can bring ruin into our lives. What pressures does it bring to your step? Is it the chronic pain, arthritis? Maybe it's some issue with digestion that it alters the food that you eat. Maybe it's back pain that, that alters your activity. You can't do the things that you once did. Have you experienced the limitations of having bad credit or financial challenges? What did your former spouse say to you that has left you bleeding? Maybe your past has left you with a prognosis that threatens your future. What did your father say to you that still follows you all these years later after it was said? The prognosis of the diagnosis, it brings pressure into our lives. And that can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. It brought multiple pressures to this woman. I want to talk about them for a minute. It brought a physical pressure. For 12 long years, she had dealt with this issue in her body. There was chronic pain. There was fatigue. The Bible, actually, the word plague, it means to chew, to consume, to devour. Have you ever felt like there were situations in your life that devoured? It just gnawed at you. It just ate away. There were emotional pressures. Imagine her weariness, the hopelessness, the ongoing pain. I have a family member who deals with chronic pain, and I, it's painful to watch his pain. Isn't it hard to watch those that you love suffer? Even the suffering that we watch that we may not feel, our hearts feel it because they're, we're, we care for them. We're walking with them. Can you imagine the long years, day after day after day, feeling so beat down, hopeless, going to the doctors, trying to fix things. Nothing was working. Now she had nothing left in her pockets, and she was actually getting worse. Can you imagine day after day, nothing changes? It's emotionally wearying. You know, 12 years is a long time, but it's even longer when you're dealing with pain. It's even longer when you're locked in a marriage 
that's abusive. It's even longer when there's distance between you and your adult children. There was financial pressure. pressure. She had spent all that she had on doctors, and she was broke. And again, no better for it. And you're saying, wow, Stephanie, I came to church this morning to get encouraged. This is not what I was expecting. But wait, it'll get better. But not yet. Because we have to talk about the relational pressure that she felt. And this was one that we have to press into a little bit more. Because back in that day, because of the law, what was going on in her body meant that she was unclean. She couldn't touch anyone or anything without defiling them. If she was married, the Bible doesn't tell us, but if she was married, she couldn't touch her husband. If she had children, she couldn't hug them. Can you imagine not being able to hug your children? She couldn't eat from the same dishes. She couldn't use the same silverware. She couldn't sit in the same furniture because it would be defiled and then no one else could touch it. We're talking about isolation. We are talking about separation. She was emotionally cut off from her friends and family. She was an outcast among her own people. She was there, but not there. Have you ever felt lonely in a crowded room? Have you ever felt isolated, even when you're insulated with people? I have. This wasn't just an inconvenience. It was isolation. You know, we just lived through a time in our culture where isolation was, became a, a necessary thing, an encouraged thing. And people were cut off from their families. It was heartbreaking. Watching people be separated and sick in the hospital and their families couldn't get to them. I had a friend who visited her mom in a nursing home through the window for a year and a half, not able to touch her mom, not able to just sit with her and hug her and do her hair. We just lived isolation. The nurses, actually, it showed pictures, maybe you saw them, where caregivers, nurses, were filling up rubber gloves with warm water and placing them under the hands of sedated patients so they would feel like a human was touching them. Because we were never meant to live in isolation. We were never meant to be separated from one another. And that's all this woman had known for 12 years. She wasn't always like that. So she knew the beauty of touch. She knew the the embrace of hugs. Can you imagine living a life where you knew what it was like to get a hug from your mom and then something changes and no more? Isolation. I want to introduce you to um, our sweet boy. Where's Josiah? In the back. He was the one singing very loudly during worship. Maybe not, maybe, maybe not on tune. Hey, Josiah, come here real quick. Come here. Go fast, fast feet. This is our joy boy. (laughs) This is our joy boy, Josiah Martinez, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) As you can see, he's so shy. You know, he's not used to being in front of people. But um, can you say hi? Hi. Tell him your name. Hi. Tell him your name. Sasha. Josiah. How old are you? Seven. Seven. That's right. Okay, go back with Thea. Say bye. He is our sweet boy. And you know, with like just like with all children, he came with a lot of surprises. And one of those surprises was a diagnosis of Down syndrome. That's something that Daddy and I weren't expecting. We didn't know about. Sometimes ladies know before. I didn't know before. So all of a sudden, the day he was born, the landscape kind of changed, and our eyes got big. And it's like, oh, whoa, okay. What's happening here? And it's brought a, a different... Um, it's brought a different journey than we expected. It's brought highs. It's brought lows. It's brought tears. It's, it's brought rejoicing. It's brought 
a workout for my faith muscles like I have never experienced before. But one of the things that we deal with is Josiah is still working on his words developing. So we use a lot of sign language. And he also, he, he says a lot of jargon. You know how like little toddlers and babies, they'll just go on and tell you all sorts of stories and you don't know what it, and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, really? And you answer them. Well, our seven-year-old is still kind of in developmentally in that place. And, you know, sometimes disease, disorders, things can make you feel different, can make you feel disconnected. And my mama's heart watches as my social bug goes up to pretty much every child he sees and just starts talking to them. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you're a Star Wars fan or not, but it's kind of like he's a character in Star Wars and I need to speak Wookiee to understand him. You know, I can't interpret what he's saying. It's like a foreign language, and, and I find myself being in the other room or wherever I am. I'm always kind of listening and tuned in for his voice because a lot of times I'll have to, if I can, interpret what he's saying to whomever he's speaking with. Or I see it with children where he'll go up and just start having a full-blown conversation, and the kid just looks at him and goes, like, I, I see the, the face. It's like... What language are you speaking? And sometimes we laugh about it, and then sometimes my mama's heart breaks as I see the disconnect. We don't believe he's going to live there forever, but right now I feel it. I feel the disconnect for him. I feel that difference, and it hurts. Disease and disorders, they can make us feel disconnected. Maybe you can't do things that you used to do. So maybe some of your friends have changed because you can't do some of the same activities that you used to do together. In this situation, for this woman, it also robbed her of our, her identity. She was never named. She was only referred to as the woman with the issue of blood. Her disease defined her, and her, prognos her prognosis did not look promising until she heard that Jesus was coming into town. Verse 28 says, she thought another, in the King James, it says, she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And think, I want us to not read and think about this story in the sense of like we're reading a chemistry textbook. I'm sorry if any of you are chemistry teachers, but chemistry was not my friend. This is not a chemistry book. This is a children's pop-up book. Can we read it with that kind of imagination and that kind of grip? Imagine this woman in her weary, broken state, weak. She crawled through the crowd because she kept saying, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She couldn't touch anybody. She had to be on the ground. She had to be invisible. But she kept saying, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She was breaking the law in this brazen act. And as she was crawling, I think she was saying, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She got stepped on. She got kicked. She got knocked down. This wasn't a straight, easy shot to Jesus. There was a huge crowd pressing in on him. She was weaving among the people. She was trying to avoid him. I bet, her, I bet she got stepped on. I bet her clothes got ripped. She was filthy. But she kept saying, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Finally, she saw the tassels of his garment. He was a rabbi. So that's what a rabbi would wear. She could tell the difference between Jesus and everybody else because the tassels were on his clothes. And according to Malachi, it says that the son of God, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, referring to those tassels. And I think she was exhausted. And maybe she had to pause a couple times along this way, but she saw the tassels. So with one last stitch of energy, she lunged because she kept saying, if I can just, yes, I got it. And she stopped right there. Immediately, she felt the healing of God come into her body. Immediately, 
her bleeding stopped. Immediately, she knew she was whole. Can you imagine that? 12 years of pain gone in an instant. And this woman, she didn't jump up and start cheering. No, remember what she did was breaking the law. So she intended it to be a touch and run. Just touch Jesus and get out of here. Get what I need and take off. But Jesus knew something had happened. He knew. So he said to his disciples, he was like, who touched me? I think they thought, Jesus, you're nuts. How can, what do you mean who touched you? There's a crown they're pressing in on you. Everybody's touching you. See, they didn't know that a miraculous transaction had just taken place. Jesus knew it. The woman knew it. And Jesus was about ready to make sure everybody else knew it. He noticed it. He was going to show and tell everybody what had just happened because the provision of his promise brings restoration. And for all the volume and magnitude of suffering, we're going to see all the volume and magnitude of his restoration. Physically, she was immediately healed. The bleeding stopped. What was devouring her was defeated. You know, we can learn to live with ailments, can't we? And just accept them as the prognosis of our lives. When I was in high school, I played softball. I was a catcher. Love to rip the mask off after each play. I love to steal bases. That was the other thing. I love to catch. I love to steal. It was legal in that. And there was this one game that um, I, I slid stealing second base. But when I, when I did, I, I kind of decided late to slide because I love to slide and get dirty. So I was sliding into second, but I decided too late. And my cleat, the top of my cleat got stuck. And I ended up sitting Indian style on my foot in this position. Not the way it's supposed to go. And, uh, but I'm also stubborn. So I took a minute, you know, walked it off. It felt not good. I'm like, that's OK. I stole the next pitch to, to third. I scored, I caught the next inning, I was up to bat, I hit a foul ball, but took off down the first baseline, got to first base, found out it was foul, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. I was in so much pain by then, I couldn't. My dad took me to the hospital, and um, we found that I had broken my foot. What we didn't know is I had done a lot more damage than we realized. So the break healed, and, but my foot wasn't getting better. I couldn't run. I couldn't, um, it, I, couldn't, I couldn't wear heels. I know, guys. What a travesty, right? I couldn't wear heels. Um, and I went to different doctors. I went to physical therapists. They tried all sorts of treatments on me. Nothing was working. Finally, my orthopedic surgeon said, well, we're just going to have to do exploratory surgery to see what's going on because I don't have an explanation for this. Come to find out I had, I had choked off the blood supply to the side of my foot, when I slid. So um, that meant that part of my bone and tendon had died. Anyways, they did surgery, drilled holes. I won't go any further, lest any of you have weak stomachs. But went through the surgery, and the doctor said, you're going to have arthritis for the rest of your life in that foot. And I, I did. I had, a, I had arthritis. I was an 18, 19-year-old going to college with arthritis. I couldn't run. Still couldn't wear heels. Um, and I went to school in Barrington, Rhode Island, where all it is is cold and wet, which that was a, that's not a great combination for arthritis. I felt pain all the time in my foot. Just walking made it sore. And that's I was like, okay, well, you know, I do what I got to do. I got rid of my heels and all that, except one pair of pumps. I kept a pair of pumps. And we were out doing ministry one morning with my college group, and I wore the pumps, and halfway through, man, I threw my shoes off when we went to the back of the room on a break, and my, my friend said, what's, what's wrong? I said, my foot is killing me. Just, you know, the arthritis is, like, well, let's pray. Okay. So he prayed. God instantly healed my foot of arthritis. 
I can run even when I don't want to. I can wear heels. I, all of the things that I was altering, suddenly I have no pain. Thank God because I live in Michigan. The cold doesn't hurt my foot because instantly God healed me, healed me of something that should have followed me the rest of my life. We don't have to live with those things that the doctors say they're going to follow you for the rest of your life because you know what follows us? The goodness of God. There was restoration physically. There was emotional restoration. Imagine her relief in knowing that her pain was gone. All those years of dealing with it. The word so-so, whole, means to rescue someone from suffering. And that's what Jesus did. There was financial restoration. In verse 34, in the King James Version, this is how it reads. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And I, I was thinking when I was studying this, he says whole twice. And knowing that not everything translates in languages just the same, like my father-in-law, he tells me a joke in Spanish, and then they translate it in English, but it's not as funny in English as it is in Spanish, right? So it's the same thing that happens there were different words that the Bible uses in their original language. So the word, even though it says whole twice in our Bible, it's two different words in that verse in the original text. It was so-so and it was hugies. And that word means to cause to grow, increase, become greater. When God restores, he doesn't do it halfway. And he doesn't leave anything untouched. He goes after it all. That's why he took the stripes on his back. That's why he went to the cross. Because he didn't want to just fix our disease. He wanted to heal our souls. He wanted to bless finances. He wanted us to be in a good state and cause us to prosper. Because he is for us and not against us. Disease steals, but God's healing brings restoration in every area that's been robbed. There was relational restoration. Before this, she was only known as the woman with the issue of blood. And then Jesus called her daughter, and she went from issue to identity. She could have been in trouble for what she did, but Jesus gave her a name. Issues leave us nameless, but the healer gives us identity. He spoke relationship between her and him. He turned her touch and run into a face-to-face encounter, and he affirmed her brazen act of faith. But he didn't stop there. This is like the infomercial part, you know, when they go all through these things, and they say, you have this, you have this. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. Because when Jesus does something, he does it all. The last thing Jesus said to her in their encounter was, go in peace. That word is Irene. And I figured it would mean shalom. You know, we know Jehovah Shalom. He's our peace. It's not. It's a different word. And it means harmony among people. Jesus was saying, go in peace in peace, go in harmony. So what he was saying is he was restoring this outcast. He was saying to the crowd, she is no longer defiled. She is no longer to live in isolation. So you better give this woman a great big hug. You can touch her. He spoke relational harmony into her life that had been gone because again when Jesus does something he does it the whole way Jesus can can restore relationships and that's exactly what this woman what happened for this woman we don't have to live under the diagnosis of the prognosis Right? We don't have to live under the prognosis of the diagnosis. We can live in the provision of his promise. But how? How? It's a great story, but how? What do we learn from this woman with the issue now called daughter? One, we talk truth. We keep saying. Just like verse 28 said, she said. 
keep saying, keep saying, if I may touch but his clothes, I'll be whole. When Josiah was three, he had a special hearing test that was done in the OR under sedation. They suspected that he wasn't hearing properly, and sure enough, that test proved that um, that to be true. And I remember when I got the doctor's report, I was sitting in my sitting at the dining room table, and I was reading it, and it said Josiah has permanent sensorineural hearing loss bilaterally. I remember that word permanent, it irked me. As soon as I read it, I stopped reading the report at that moment. I held up that paper and I said, Lord, I thank you that permanent is not in your vocabulary. God, do a miracle. Because permanent is not in God's vocabulary. Sometimes you got to talk that truth. You got to keep saying you got to press through the crowd, and you got to keep saying. you got to look the test results straight in the face and keep saying, God, do a miracle. Permanent is not in his vocabulary. Terminal, not in his vocabulary. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. I think just like she did, she was driven by what she was saying. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I can just. Josiah's prognosis, it's a medical fact. Fine. But we choose to keep talking the truth of God that he is healed. We can take practical steps while we keep saying. You know, it's not wrong to go to doctors. I think we have, may have logged thousands of hours of therapies at this point with occupational and physical and speech and all sorts of things. We, we access the helps and the tools that are out there to strengthen who he is and what's going on in his life and to work with the landscape that there is, right? We take practical steps. That's not wrong. We've adjusted, but we haven't acquiesced. We haven't given in without protest. We protest it through prayer. We protest it in what we're saying. And all those practical tools, they're a help, but the healer is still our hope. And that's where we're going. We need to touch him with intention while we keep saying. That's what faith is. Her touch was driven by faith. In our story, the crowd touched him, and what did they get? Nothing. She touched him, and she got everything. She was driven by what she was saying. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. What do you have to say in your life to press through the crowd? What do you have to say? What do you need to fill your mouth with in a broken relationship? in a tumultuous relationship? What do you need to say about the report of your finances, about the doctor's report? Keep saying it. When we put Josiah to bed at night, almost every night, we will say, Lord, we thank you that you're healing his ears, you're strengthening his muscles, you're sharpening his intellect. You are bringing forth both the accuracy and the fluency of his words, that your destiny and plan for him is being unfolded, that he brings your joy, light, and love to all those that he's around. We speak those things over him. We declare those things. We keep saying, while we go to therapy, While we work on this, while we work on that, we keep saying because the healer is our hope. And then the healer will step in and we get to testify of what God's done. About a year and a half ago, I had Josiah at the audiologist and it's a, we go there every six months. We have since he was one and he was getting checked and I know his frequencies where he starts to splinter in his hearing. I know his decibel levels, meaning the the volume of sound of when he starts to have trouble. Because I would hold him during his, his hearing tests and, you know, there would be a sound and I heard it and he didn't. And I'd be like, oh because I knew my baby wasn't hearing the way he should. So I know those things, and I was there a year and a half with our audiolo- a year and a half ago with our audiologist, Julie, and we were watching. I was watching her screen, and she was 
doing it, and they do it. They hold a little toy up to his ear, and when he hears the sound, he puts the peg in the board. So that's his little game that he plays to kind of acknowledge in his eyes if he's hearing something. A lot of times you'll see it in his eyes before you see it in his action. And so she, they're doing their test, and I'm watching Julie's screen. Looks pretty normal. And then I'm seeing where his trouble frequencies are. She's work testing that area, and I see her at 30 dB. Okay. He responds. 25 dB. Responds. 20 dB. He responds. And I'm sitting there thinking, he's never responded to this. And the, he wasn't wearing his hearing aids. He's never responded to this. Julie does another test and another test. And then she gets done. She didn't say a word. She just went, she like, I, I don't know. I'm getting him better than I've ever gotten him before. I guess I'll just turn down his hearing aids. She's kind of like asking me, like, I guess I'll do this. But can you come back in three weeks so we can retest? I'm like, and I'm trying, like, not to cry, not to jump, but, you know, I'm overflowing with emotions because I'm watching the results of God beginning to heal him, knowing we've been praying, knowing we've been asking. And I'm like, sure, we'll come back in three weeks. Three weeks, the same thing happens. She's like, yeah, okay. So I was talking with a speech therapist. I said, Julie turned down his hearing aid. She's like, I saw that in the note. And then um, she was like, well, and at first she was like, okay. She's like, wait. His hearing can't get better. He doesn't have conductive where it's like tubes or it has to do with water. He has sensor and neural hearing damage. I'm like, what, what does that mean again? And she said, it means that the little hairs deep inside his ear are damaged so they don't vibrate and they don't send the right messages to the brain. That doesn't get better. And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, yes, it does when you are praying to Jehovah who heals the one who can do the miraculous we testify to it at his recent um, me educational meeting the principal was on the zoom call a bunch of therapists a bunch of teachers he has a whole entourage which I think he loves and and uh, one of the therapists said so have the doctors oh I forgot to tell you this so we went and then it started moderate, mild to moderate hearing loss. She downgraded it to mild hearing loss. We went this past spring borderline normal. She said, I'm not going to pull his hearing aids yet because, you know, I don't want, I am not sure about those lower frequencies and I don't want him to have to work harder because, you know, when you have to work harder to understand something, you tend not to and you tune out. And that's the last thing we need with a seven-year-old boy is a reason to not pay attention. So he's still wearing hearing aids, but borderline normal. And one of the therapists at a school meeting asked the question, have the, have the doctors been able to give any explanation for the improvement in his hearing? And I'm like, I said, no, there is no medical explanation. I said, but his daddy and I pray, and we believe in a God who does miracles. And the principal and his teacher, they're like, amen. I'm like, okay. We testified, but we keep saying, we keep saying all those things that are going on that touch Josiah's life, that touch our lives. We keep saying because we refuse to live under the prognosis of the diagnosis. We want to live in the provision of his promise, and so can you in every area of your life. Our hearts can be encouraged. So this morning, what's driving you? What are you declaring? What's filling your mouth? What are you saying? You might, you might need to get some language from the Lord. You might need to have some language put in there. There was a story of, of a seminary professor who was vacationing with his wife and um, El Eloy. There, you were so dark, you blended into the corner. <laughs> Can you come, babes? <laughs> there was a seminary professor vacationing in Gatlinburg with his wife and one morning, they were eating breakfast at a table, and in the restaurant, there was this 
older gentleman with white hair, and he was just going around to all the different tables. And the guy saw it, and he was like, oh, I hope he doesn't come over here. You know, when you're like, nope, you don't see me, you don't see me. They just wanted to enjoy their breakfast in quiet. And sure enough, though, the man came over. He said, where are you folks from? He asked in a friendly voice. They said they were from Oklahoma. He said, well, great to have you in Tennessee. What do you do? He said, I'm a seminary professor. He said, oh, so you teach preachers how to preach. He was like, yeah, I, I guess I do. He's like, well, I've got a great story for you. You see, over there in the foothills of that mountain, there was a boy who was born to an unwed mother. And that boy had a hard time growing up because wherever he would go, they would always ask the question, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And the little boy didn't know what to say because the real answer was he didn't know who his dad was. And this was in the early 1900s. He would go to the grocery store, same question. He'd hide at recess because he wanted to avoid the question from his friends. He wanted to avoid the mockery. He would go to church and he was 12 years old and a new preacher had come into town and this little boy would always come in after service started and he would, he would jet before it was over because he didn't want to hear the question that he dreaded, who's your daddy? But this one time, the pastor got the benediction in so fast that the little boy didn't get time to get out the door so he got caught up in the crowd and he made his way to the pastor who was greeting people as they exited and saw the little boy and said, who's your daddy? The dreaded question. Silence in the room. Felt the eyes glaring at him. The preacher kind of sensing what was going on. He's like, you know what? I recognize you. I see the family resemblance. You're a child of God. And the little boy smiled for the first time in response to that question. And the preacher said to him, well, you've got a great inheritance, so you go and claim it. And that boy left. And then you know what this man said who was sitting at the table? He said, man, I don't know whatever would have come of my life if I hadn't run into that preacher that day. And he walked away. The man and his wife were stunned, and they called the waitress over, and they said, who was that man? And she's like, well, everybody knows him. That's Ben Hooper. He's the governor of Tennessee. A boy, true story, a boy who knew shame got a new story that day. And he put a new language in his mouth. Not shame. Not dread of the question. Instead, sonship. Instead, relationship. He exchanged the language of prognosis for the language of promise, and it took him from shame to success. That's what happens. Would you stand with me this morning? Maybe you're in a situation. Maybe you don't have any glaring issues. Thank God. Celebrate. Be thankful. Store up this word because things touch our lives. But maybe you need to exchange the language of prognosis. Maybe you've been talking the problem. It's easy to talk the problem. I get that. Maybe you need to exchange the language of prognosis for the language of promise that I am healed. If I can just touch. Some of you maybe have lived with the, the questions, what if? What if God doesn't heal? What if? Can we change that to what this woman said? If I can just touch his clothes, I will. Let that be your if. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I can just touch him, the relationship will be restored between my kids and myself. If I can just touch him, 
he can restore my finances. Maybe some of that language needs to shift in you and you need to declare and speak those things as you're pressing through life, maybe as you're getting kicked, maybe as you're getting knocked down, maybe as the cares of this world are crushing in on you. What's the language that you're using? It makes all the difference between life and death. We're going to, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to just sing some of that song and declare, you said, I believe. But then I want to change the words, and then I want to flip it to say, I say, and you did. Because it's a partnership. He says it, it's done. I say it, it's done. We come into agreement with the language of the promise and see the restoration of God make its way into every era of our lives. If you, if you are dealing with a situation, be it health, finances, whatever it is, and you say, I'm going to exercise the language of promise, would you raise your hand? Jesus, you see the needs that I have. Jesus, you see, I see the problem. You already have the solution. I thank you, Jesus, that you give us new words to replace the words of death and diagnosis that have plagued our lives. What doctor said, I thank you that it's not in your vocabulary because you cannot fail and you cannot lie. So I thank you, Lord, that chronic pain goes in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that eye trouble goes in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that intestinal issues clear up in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that family relationships are restored and that you bring reconciliation just like you did for this woman. I thank you that you speak your identity over our lives and that even places of shame from our past are rewritten and are written over by the sonship, by the identity that you speak over us and that we come into agreement with that so that we say, I'm a child of God and it changes and alters the very course of our life and the life of the generations that follow us. Thank you, Jesus, for the language of promise for the language of prognosis. Speak the words to us. Help us to keep saying, to keep saying, to keep saying, to keep saying, no matter how we feel, to keep saying, no matter what the doctors say, to keep saying, no matter what we see with our eyes, to keep saying. Thank you, Jesus. You said I believe, I say it, I say it, it is done, you said it, you said it, I believe, I say it, I say it, it is done, you said, you said it, I believe it, I say it, I say it. It is done, you said, I believe it, I said, I say it, it is done, you said, I believe, I say it, I say it, it is done, you said.
believe for it from the impossible we'll see a miracle god we believe yes we do god we believe for it Jesus, God, we believe for it. You said, so I say it's done. God, we believe for it. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, I believe by your stripes, God, we believe. Jesus. One more time, honey. Move the immovable. Break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of your word. Let it stand as an anchor to our soul. Even when we feel like we're getting knocked down, kicked around, stepped on in life, in the situations that we're facing, I thank you that we keep saying and we keep pressing because we know you're the healer, because we know that you're the restorer. Jesus, we love you. want to be sensitive to the the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit I believe that he's working right now so this is what we're gonna do if you feel like your heart is released God bless you thank you for the honor it was to share this time with you and we want to release you to go